Oh, hey, Mr. Dunham back here, and we've been going to be talking immunology part two. So in the first one, um, we had a look about infectious versus non-infectious disease, and we classified that infectious diseases were things that were contagious, and you could pass them on. Non-infectious diseases were things that it didn't matter if I had the disease, there's nothing I could do that would then influence somebody else. For example, if I got fat, it wouldn't matter how fat I got, no one else would get fat because of me. However, if I did get, say, the flu, and I wasn't um, you know, good with my hygiene, I could pass that to everyone else. So I've just got a, a few examples here of both living and non-living examples of infectious disease as a little recap. So remember we had parasites, uh, we had protozoa, fungi, um, prokaryotics like bacteria, um, and then non-living uh, infectious disease agents like viruses and prions. So if you haven't watched that initial video, um, up in the corner there'll be a little, uh, like a little tag. Click on that and you can see that first video. Okay, so uh, we know that non-infectious diseases are caused by um, genetic things, malnutrition, environment and lifestyle. And um, here's an example, even allergies can be considered um, diseases if they you know, give you symptoms and change the way that your body is acting and we consider that to be a disease. Um, some of these aren't gonna be life-threatening, but you know, some of them do cause people um, some issues. We talked briefly about um, how do these infectious agents um, get into our body, and what we uh, noted is that really any orifice or any opening to our body is um, an area of concern. So for bacteria, you know, any hole really is a goal for them. So they're going to be looking at uh, mouth, ear, um, any of our uh, sexual orifices, um, you know, tear ducts, really any area that they can access and penetrate the skin, um, they can get in there and cause a disease. Really anything um, that you have any injuries or any cuts, that's now an area where um, a pathogen could get in, okay? So, Later on in the series, when we're going to be talking about how our body defends itself, we're going to be looking at um, one, how to prevent you know, those pathogens entering the body, um, but two, once they're in there, how do we cope with that? Okay, so in this particular um, tutorial, we're going to be looking at more pathogen transmission and survival. So we know the difference between infectious and non-infectious. Now talking about infectious, how do they, um, you know, how do we get access and come into contact with these pathogens? and then um, how, what do they do to survive? And so there's some key terminology um, that we've got to be mindful of, and that is a pathogen is a disease-causing agent. Okay, so something that's gonna present symptoms that are gonna cause some long-term effects. Um, that's not to be confused with an antigen, and we'll get to that later, but a pathogen is actually something that's gonna cause disease and some long-term harm to that person. Um, a host is the organism that is actually suffering from that pathogen. Okay, so if I get the flu, um, I am the host suffering from that viral pathogen. And then finally, we have a vector. So a vector is something that is going to spread or transmit that pathogen. Um, so for example, uh, malaria is, um, is the disease caused by a particular pathogen, but it's spread by mosquitoes. Okay, so the mosquito is the vector spreading that pathogen and causing more widespread disease. Um, so how are these pathogens and, and that actually transmitted? Ugh, yuck, that's one way, what are the others? So really, um, when we look at pathogen transmission, there's really, um, we can summarize it in direct contact or indirect entry into tissue or blood, or a disease-carrying vector penetrates um, our skin or uh, introduces that um, pathogen into our body. So let's just go through a few of them. So direct contact, um, for example, if I um, sneeze, I'm sick, um, now those droplets of liquid with the pathogen inside, because it's you know, very small, um, and now on my skin, I then go and uh, touch somebody else, um, they've now could potentially have that then enter their body and get sick also. Um, an indirect version of that might be, you know, I sneeze, 
I then put my hand on the escalator to support myself and then the next person puts their hand on there and contracts it um, from me indirectly. Um, bathrooms are big problems with this. That's why I don't like in Australia that to get out of a bathroom you actually have to touch the door. Think about that for a second. If it could somehow just swing open from the inside, um, that way I wouldn't even have to touch the outside door and because I don't know if the person before me has washed their hands and that's pretty gross. At least if I'm going in to the toilet and I have to touch the door, I know I'm going to eventually wash my hands but you can't always guarantee the person before you has done that so a bit of food for thought there. Um, exchanging of fluids, um, so we've got uh, this beautiful little couple down here. Uh, if they're exchanging fluids of, of any kind, um, they could be exchanging pathogens. Okay, so we've got to be extremely safe with any activity where fluids might be uh, exchanged um, or that fluid might enter our body. Um, and you know, if you follow sport, they have a blood rule. If it's really excessive blood um, to protect the potential of any um, pathogens, um, those people have to are removed from the field, get treatment before they can come back on. Contamination is a huge one. Anyone going on a cruise uh, knows of all those gastro outbreaks. Basically, that's uh, contamination from fecal matter um, and then contacting with people and then things like salmonella um, or other sort of uh, bacteria and, and viruses get in contact with other people and then our body reacts in a way to try and remove that from the body, which isn't pleasant. Um, if food, it, raw food in particular, um, if that's not cooked well enough, um, we're not destroying the bacteria and then when we consume that, um, ingest it, we are now um, ingesting the pathogen and can get quite sick. Not only can you get contaminated food, you can get contaminated water as well. And in third world countries, that's particularly problematic. Airborne, so every time someone uh, sneezes or things like that, um, we have droplets containing pathogen spread through the air and then people can get that through their body in a mouth, ear, whatever, and get sick. That final one, um, here, the vector is that some kind of animal or organism um, carrying that disease and then passing it on. And sometimes it takes a vector to be able to um, move that particular disease from one species to another. Um, for example, uh, a mosquito is a great example of a vector, but we also have um, birds where a virus will affect a bird because not just people get affected by pathogens, um, plants and birds and other animals do as well, but it might mutate within that species and then that species can then pass it on to human, for example. And that's where you know bird flu and swine flu and those types of terms come from. So they're the, really the key um, types of transmission that can occur and you need to be aware of um, in, in terms of this course um, so you can um, answer questions about it. But not just knowing them, understanding the implications of that type of transmission and therefore what could we do in terms of um, being healthy to prevent um, pathogens entering our body in those means. So how could we prevent ourselves from getting sick through direct contact? How could we prevent ourselves from getting sick through exchange of fluids and so on? And the final thing we're going to talk about just quickly in this video is that some of these pathogens can't replicate independently. For example, um, bacteria can. So bacteria um, can replicate independently. They, they can um, increase their numbers, reproduce, and that's what really happens when you get really sick. They increase to a certain level that then you start to see the symptoms. However, viruses, on the other hand, aren't that way, and they're pretty clever. So they'll come up and bind to, so they'll get in your body, um, they'll come and bind to the outside of cells, and then they'll inject their DNA into your cell. Your cell doesn't know the difference between its DNA and any other organism's DNA, and we actually utilize that with genetic engineering techniques. And so what happens is the machinery within our cells sees DNA, sees um, RNA, um, and, and basically the virus will inject RNA, get it made into DNA, then get it um, made back into RNA, and then our body then um, our ribosomes then translate the RNA molecule into a protein and into more virus um, cell, like little virus pieces, puts that virus together, 
and then you get so many viruses in the cell, the cell explodes, releasing all these other virus particles, which then go to other cells and do the exact same thing. So viruses actually need other cells to make more of them. So they're technically not living, and therefore can remain quite dormant, and then once you then get infected, it then starts going to work, making more of itself, infecting more cells that then make more virus and then um, they start taking over the function of regular cells and you get sick. So for example, HIV um, takes over you know, our white blood cell production and prevents those cells from working properly and then we get other um, pathogens into our body and we no longer have the immune system and white blood cells to fight that. So we get very sick. So hopefully that was a, a, a nice little rundown of um, pathogen transmission and survival and a little recap from before. Um, if you like the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you have any questions below, please ask them. Thank you.